Hi, folks. Uh, welcome back. So our first speaker is Dr. Susan Annenberg. <laughs> Sorry, is that, is that, that's okay. Wait, wait, is, is that, welcome. I always like to make an entrance. Um, okay, wonderful. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I was asked to be a part of this panel on climate change and air quality. And so I thought, which of our projects that are, which of our uh, many projects that are supported by Haycast align with this topic? And um, what came to mind most is our work that I've been referring to as the 13,000 Cities Project. Um, so I'd like to just tell you a little bit about the evolution of this project and where it currently stands and where we'd like to go next. And this doesn't work. Cities are coming together in groups like C40 cities um, and developing urban climate action plans where maybe collectively uh, cities around the world have a similar target and maybe individually each city develops its own target for meeting climate goals. We also have air quality uh, targets, so those might be ambient air quality standards that are typically set at the national scale or the World Health Organization guidelines, uh, which were recently revised just a couple of years ago to be more health protective. Um, increasingly, we're seeing cities also have targets for natural spaces. This is relatively newer, I would say, than um, air quality and uh, greenhouse gases. But um, cities have now come together, especially through C40 cities, and created an urban nature declaration. C40 now has an activity that they call the Urban Nature Accelerator, which involves uh, about 96 cities around the world who have targets for expanding green space. A problem with... Uh, the, these targets is that we don't really have a great way for cities to assess their ability to meet the targets uh, or for anyone else outside of these cities to track whether or not cities are improving along this continuum towards meeting the targets. So we set out a few years ago to uh, develop estimates of air quality, air pollution concentrations in all cities worldwide, leveraging the power of satellite data. This really is not possible to do without satellite data. So because the satellite data are geographically complete, uh, spatially around the world uh, with our polar orbiting satellites, they have high enough uh, spatial resolution now that we can discern what's happening at the urban scale. We can estimate PM 2.5, ozone, and NO2 concentrations for all cities all around the world. So that's, uh, we published three papers. I think these came out in 2022 or 2023, led by Veronica Sutherland, Arash Moheg, who's um, somewhere in the crowd, and uh, Danny Malishak. Um, so, you know, papers are great, we like papers, but more importantly is who is going to use these results and how. Um, so we were really pleased to partner with the Health Effects Institute, who uh, had been for a while leading a state of global air activity, which was kind of tied to the global burden of disease study. Um, and they created a new element to their state of global air uh, uh, activity for cities specifically. So um, there was a report that came out, air quality and health in cities, and then an interactive website which portrayed on a map um, how pollution concentrations vary depending on the city geographically. So this is now available uh, publicly and you know, the HEI has become a really strong go-to resource for anyone around the world looking for information about air quality and you can now get it at the urban scale. And as I mentioned yesterday, most recently, just a few weeks ago, these NO2 concentrations have just been incorporated into the Global Burden of Disease Study. For the first time, we have a risk outcome pair in the Global Burden of Disease Study that links an air pollutant to asthma, pediatric asthma incidents. Previously, it had just incorporated PM2.5 and ozone and premature mortality. Now it incorporates asthma as well, which we all know is very strongly linked with, with air pollution. But so that's... Um, our progress that we made during this phase of Haycast uh, on air pollution in 13,000 cities. What about CO2 emissions? So we had been partnering with uh, C40 cities and each individual city develops a bottom-up inventory of CO2 emissions coming from their city. So they're, you know, they're putting together vast amounts of information about activity levels, the sources in their city and how much people are driving and how much people are burning wood, et cetera. Um, they're bringing together emission factors and developing this bottom-up inventory of greenhouse gas emissions coming from the city. But we can also use satellites for this problem too. So we have, you know, global data sets that our group doesn't develop, other people do, um, of uh, CO2 emissions 
from fossil fuels on a gridded basis all around the world. And so we wondered, could we use these at the urban scale too, like we're doing for air pollution? So uh, Doyan An and uh, Dan Goldberg created this uh, estimate of um, CO2 emissions from globally available, globally gridded data sets of fossil fuel CO2 emissions and compared that to bottom-up inventories and found basically that the, the comparison was strong enough that we feel comfortable that we can use these globally gridded data sets as a first cut of CO2 emissions coming from cities around the world, which is really very beneficial because not every city has the level of staff and resources that the cities that are involved in C40 have to be able to develop their own bottom-up inventories. Oops. Okay. So now we're transitioning to what's the next stage of this 13,000 cities work? How do we leverage more uh, insights from it? And you know, one thing we hadn't done in the past, we had taken a pollutant by pollutant approach. We had looked at PM 2.5 in 13,000 cities, ozone in 13,000 cities, NO2 in 13,000 cities, and CO2. But what can we tell if we look at all four of these pollutants at the same time, looking at all of these cities globally? So this is some work being done by our PhD students, Su Young Kim and Gage Kerr. Um, and you can just look at the map of how these pollutants uh, look spatially in all cities around the world in 2019. These maps do not align very well with each other. There are large differences in spatial distribution of these pollutants, um, especially with NO2 is, you know, even though we have dramatic declines as we saw yesterday in NO2 in the United States, NO2 is still very high in, uh, in um, high income countries compared with uh, something like uh, PM 2.5, which is uh, really the low and middle income countries now are much higher in, in uh, total PM 2.5 concentrations. So um, how do we look at all these four together, all these four pollutants together and try to tease out some insights? Um, this is what I like to call our spaghetti spider web plots. Um, the uh, each gray line here represents a city and then the blue is the global average across all cities. Um, and then you have estimates of the percent change in uh, PM 2.5, fossil fuel, CO2, ozone, and NO2 across these cities in each region. And so just looking at the global uh, spaghetti spider web plot in the top left here, um, we see kind of a mixed bag in terms of how these pollutants have changed. But if you look at the high income cities, uh, which is the third from the left on the top, uh, we see declines in all of these uh, four pollutants. In other regions, we see increases. Um, and so we're starting to dig into, you know, are, are we seeing correlations in the temporal trends between these pollutants? Are they uh, positive correlations, negative correlations, or just not correlated? And why might we be seeing differences in those, um, those types of effects in different cities? So this is still work in, a work in progress. I mentioned green space at the beginning as well, and this is an area that's increasing, uh, of increasing importance to cities. Um, a few years back, C40 created an urban nature declaration, which I think at the time had like 32 cities that had signed on, onto it. They had two, um, they had two uh, goals. One was 30 to 40 percent of um, the total built up city surface area has green space or permeable spaces. And the other was more about accessibility and connectivity. Uh, where 70% of the city population has access to green space. So what we're trying to do is link together what we can tell from satellite data in terms of what people actually experience on the ground in terms of green space. Um, there's a lot of epidemiological literature that links green space with um, improvements in people's health and uh, mortality. So this is um, a work in progress, but some early results show that there's dramatic variation in green space in urban areas around the world. Um, and we hope to have more results for you on this soon. And just a quick plug for if anyone is interested in knowing these uh, results and getting estimates for your city, we have them all online at urbanairquality.online and we will add um, green space to this when it's ready. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susan, for that uh, comprehensive talk. Uh, just as a, a brief note, uh, our, our, this session is a little bit shorter. Speakers, thanks for being good sports about targeting that, that eight minute talk. And then a uh, shorter time for Q&A, but uh, please bring those questions at the break. And if you can't, for any reason, connect, please contact me and I'll try to connect you too. Okay, our right, next up uh, is Shanna Comley from, Comley, sorry, you're right. Shanna Comley from NASA. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm Shanna Combley. I am the stakeholder engagement lead for a newly established U.S. Greenhouse Gas Center that's headquartered at NASA headquarters, but supported with uh, lots of input from NOAA, EPA, and NIST. We, uh, we were established to help implement the national strategy for greenhouse gas monitoring and information system that was released last year, uh, around the November or December timeframe. We were asked to get started and how can we organize the US government, um, starting with these four initial agencies, um, to gather and create, uh, curate some data sets that are showing greenhouse gases and how you can use them um, to help you to understand, have some trust and some confidence and set in greenhouse gas mitigation goals um, at local, uh, state and global um, country level um, scales. We, as I said, we got started last year and um, NASA stepped forward, provided a program manager, uh, stakeholder engagement and lead, me. And they also just recently decided to establish a program office with a project scientist based out of NASA Goddard. We launched a portal last year at COP28, um, earth.gov slash GHG center, where we initially, we showcased some initial, initial capabilities that the four agencies came up with, some initial data sets that we identified that we thought could be of use and started conversations with our, with our stakeholders on how best to tailor some of the information so it could be more accessible. Um, if you go to the website right now, um, we've done a beta, I said the beta in December, we just did an update in May. Um, it's still very technical and we need a stakeholder input on what decisions are being made with these kind of data, um, what kind of analysis need to be done for us to help tailor it better. So we're always open for collaboration and discussion um, with the community on what, best should, uh, what information we should have there and how to share it. What we have on the portal right now are 13 initial data sets. We have an exploration capability where you can actually take a look at the data, um, not have to code it up yourself. <laughs> um, you can see and, and, and analyze it right there. And we have data insights where we've started to tell some stories, share stories that are told by the data. Um, and then finally, for those who do want to code it up themselves, we have a hub um, in the, that allows you to get an account, you can sign in, you can get access to Jupyter Hubs, and you can go play with the notebooks and play with the data sets that we have. Um, we also created a learn page so you can see um, tutorials, videos, uh, you can hear about news and opportunities that we have in terms of a summer school um, that we're running in a couple of weeks, stuff like that's up there. We have a Rosa solicitation out that's due in about a week. That's also going up. I think we forgot to put it up earlier. Um, but yes, but we have stuff like that on our portal. We also have videos from when we've done the, the demonstration of the portal itself, the COP release, all of these things are available. And we've started to put our trainings up there. So we've been running a webinar series. We've had some training on how to use some of the data sets we have. So those things are starting to be populated. So as I said, we are in our beta phase. Um, we got started last year or the end of our beta phase is technically December of this year, but we, ex we expect to continue. Um, um, we've been um, chatting with our, our stakeholders um, yeah, in the Office of Policy, Science, Science and Technology Policy of the White House, and they are pretty excited about what we can do. Um, and then finally, we have uh, an opportunity for folks to provide us with feedback through the portal, but also offline, and I'll go into that a little bit more. So we initially focused on three areas. Um, granted anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. So mostly this is our EPA inventory. Um, it's been graded, it's great work done by our colleagues at Harvard University um, and with our EPA colleagues, um, that data sets there, plus some other data sets that are from the satellites. Um, we have a focus on natural greenhouse sources and sinks. So this is where our global models are coming in and they're actually showing you the breakdown of what the natural world is providing um, in terms of the sink of, of the carbon um, and, and releases that, that can be seen in the natural environment. And then finally, we showcase the EMIT data sets and other high, um, large releases of methane that can be seen from leaks. We can see these from satellite, we can see it from aircraft. Right now we have the EMIT um, satellite up there and we'll be populating more with um, the, the space, the aircraft data sets that we've been collecting. And over time we'll be incorporating new data sets from, um, from NGOs and from private sector as we go through a process to validate um, the information that we're, that's coming in. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, for agencies, we have been working very hard 
to update all the initial data sets that are there. As I said, we started with 13. We've had um, mo modifications done to them at the last release that we did in March, or sorry, in May. Um, let's see, do I wanna point any of them out? Uh, no, I won't. Um, but just to let you know that some of them, we started off with monthly, now they're at daily. Some of them were um, one kilometer, I think they're now quarter. So that we've been, we've been increasing resolution, we've been increasing the temporal frequency of some of the data sets and uh, making sure that we get a continuous stream of inputs, especially from like the NOAA um, CO2 monitoring stations. We've been making sure that we get the updates of those coming in. But more to come. <laughs> As I mentioned, we have a, a robust strategy where we're trying to reach out to various stakeholders at different levels. Um, we have um, international engagement because after all, we do have to mitigate greenhouse gases globally. Um, we are developing partnerships within the federal government, but also starting to expand into the NGO space, the private sector space, the academic, the academia space. Um, all the folks who are trying to provide us with credible data sets, we're starting up a process to do that. Um, engaging with communities. This is a community. This is counting as that, but we're just starting the conversation. <laughs> so let's letting you know and doing the socialization part is, is the initial stage of engaging. Um, workshops and uh, user focus groups. We have set up user focus groups. Um, I think I have a slide with the QR code for that, but we do encourage folks to sign up. We have three groups surrounding those three initial focus areas. We bring people together and we talk about the type of analysis, as I said, the analysis they wanna do, how they use the data. And if they're not there yet, tell us what kind of work you're doing. Why did you come? Because chances are very high. You have interest in this space and we need to know how you're using data to, to, to get to what you need to do. Education and training and prizes. Um, so yeah, so these are two, two way um, engagements. We try to do about an hour to two hours. Um, the first one was two hours. We've been doing it every two months or so. The next one's gonna be in the July, August timeframe. We'll do one in October and November. And um, we'll have a stakeholder forum in December where we talk a little bit more about where do we go from the demonstration phase into full on operations. Oh, did everyone get that? I can go back. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right, um, yes, yeah, so I, I jumped to the end here just to let you know our full demonstration workshop will showcase what we've done, but we wanna hear from the community to plan ahead. We're planning that for December. For those who are going in for AGU, it's the week before AGU. The AGU is in DC this year. We're trying to hold folks to come to the area um, ahead, a week ahead of time, um, the, the, the Wednesday, Thursday before AGU, um, which is December 4th and 5th. Those are the dates we're looking at and we're trying to bring folks to the NOAA facility. So we're working on getting that venue. Um, but throughout, um, I just wanted to point out a few things. So the focus group meetings that I mentioned, those are every two months. Um, we've been targeting the large conferences, but we've also been targeting communities. So I've been working with the US Climate Alliance um, over C40. Pardon me for not going with C40, but we need someone to help us with getting to C40. So I, 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 that was a wonderful presentation. Susan, you'll be hearing from me shortly. <laughs> because that was really good to hear. Um, yeah, so we've been trying to plug in with the folks that are already working with these communities because we don't have time to build a relationship from scratch. A lot of you have done this hard work already. We need you to help. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. What a wonderful uh, interagency and exciting new initiative. Our next speaker is uh, Eric Choi from, sorry. Thank you, and I got the clicker. Chris, thank you very much, and thank you to Jenny and Tracy for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm Eric Choi, and I guess in this environment, I'm a little bit of an outlier because we're actually from the private sector. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we do and the relevance to greenhouse gases and to health and air quality. So GHGSAT uh, operates, we operate a constellation of 12 commercial greenhouse gas sensing satellites, uh, 11 of which sense methane and one of which senses carbon dioxide. And what's unique about our satellites versus others um, such as MethaneSat, which I'm sure you'll hear about later from Libby or from wide area imagers like Tropomi, is that we've sort of taken the complementary opposite approach where we've targeted relatively high spatial resolution with low detection threshold. So our spatial resolution of our satellites is 25 meters. 
and the detection threshold is 100 kilograms per hour. And what that enables, as I'll show on this slide, this uh, sort of postage stamp here, is facility level attribution of a plume. So down to an individual oil and gas pad, down to an individual vent, for example, in a coal mine, or even an active face of, of a landfill. And you can see that very clearly in the sample images here. Uh, the one on the far right is particularly interesting to me being uh, eight actually individual plumes out of an uh, oil and gas field in, in Central Asia. And to my knowledge, this was the first time that this number of plumes was captured in a single field of view. So our field of view nominally is 12 by 12 kilo kilometers. I'll uh, step through a bit of a case study here. Uh, I've, got a num I've got a number of different ones that I could probably talk about, but I picked this one mostly because of the uh, cool quote from Dr. Paul Bate, the CEO of the UK Space Agency, which talked about the importance of satellites in informing decision-making on the path to net zero. It's like, hey, this was like the theme of this session. So I guess I'll use this particular case study. So. Uh, this was last year, and we were working with Emily Dowd at the University of Leeds. She was actually interested in landfill admissions, but in one of the observations that we provided, she kind of had a gander on the different side, and a few kilometers away, she noticed an unattributed plume. And what this turned out to be was a gas leak of the uh, local utility in Wales. And it later correlated that there were complaints from residents about smell and they were having trouble tracking this down. And it turned out to be this particular emission that was uh, eventually repaired uh, in part due to the observations that we were making and the analysis that Emily and her team was doing at the University of Leeds. Uh, in terms of verification, uh, we routinely do uh, single blind uh, controlled release verifications of our performance. The image on the right is one of the very earliest ones we did in 2020, uh, shortly after the launch of our first commercial satellite. So that was actually done with industry, in this case, at Total Energy in France. And we achieved uh, within 10% of the ground truth value in that case. And the uh, correlation chart on the right is uh, extracted from a more recent 2023 paper uh, led by Evan Sherman and Adam Brandt's group at Stanford, where we are part of a series of controlled release trials, not just with different satellite systems, but aircraft and UAV systems as well. And in all the cases that were studied uh, for, for this particular project, we were uh, plus or minus 20% of the ground truth value. So, um, just a summary here of what we see just as an example is within the contiguous United States. So the statistics for the last uh, full year, 2023, we uh, made uh, over 4,500 successful observations, these being defined as any observation that was sufficiently cloud-free for us to determine whether or not there was a plume in the field of view, uh, of which there were over 1,100 uh, methane emissions observed uh, in 2023 over the contiguous United States. And what's interesting about that uh, 1137 figure is that when we correlate that to the identification of disadvantaged, marginalized, racialized uh, communities as identified by the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, we find a, a, an interesting correlation that uh, over 300 of these emissions were co-located with these areas that were identified by the uh, climate and economic justice screening tool. Um, I'll wrap uh, here with something that might be of interest to, I hope will be of interest to this community, is that over the past year, we have been undergoing the evaluation process under the NASA Commercial Small Sat Data Acquisition Program. So CSDA is the NASA program that identifies, assesses, and then makes available to the research community data from private vendors such as ourselves. So after a year long process, we're very happy to say that, yay, uh, we passed. Um, this, was, uh, this was a great effort by a number of PIs on the evaluation team that you can see on, on the bottom right, uh, including uh, here at MIT, a uh, Dr. Danielle Smith, I'm not sure if she's here, 
But that observation right there is, is in fact one of hers. She was looking at landfills in, uh, in South America. So the criteria we're evaluating, obviously usefulness of our data for advancing earth science, the quality data and the quality of user support services. So um, in passing this milestone, what it means is that uh, very soon, um, probably in the next couple of months or so, uh, our data will be available to the wider research uh, community in the United States. But if you're impatient and you can't wait, in fact, there are other mechanisms already existing to get our data. So if you're in Britain, you can get our data through the UK satellite application Catapult. And our data has actually been already available through the European Space Agency's third party mission program for about two years now. And the great thing about the ESA TPM program is you actually do not need to be a European researcher to get our data through that mechanism. It's open to anybody in the world, but we're really thrilled that thanks to NASA, our data will be available to an even wider research uh, community. So with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to take questions with the rest of my panelists a little later, I guess, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thank you very much for making the trip and providing these exciting developments and sharing your information. Next up is Libby Moore from Environmental Defense Fund. Hi, thanks everybody. Um, I'm Libby Moore and I'm a senior data analyst in Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and today I'm actually not gonna talk about methane sat, although <laughs> I will say that it successfully launched a couple of months ago and everybody's super excited about it. Um, but I am going to talk about uh, petrochemicals, air emissions, and the law. Um, and so my work at EDF is largely focused on our petrochemicals initiative. And for, for those of you who might not be familiar, uh, petrochemicals are organic chemicals that are typically made from fossil fuels, and um, they're used to manufacture things like plastic, rubber, and synthetic fibers. Um, so unfortunately, petrochemical production comes with large amounts of climate and air pollution, including emissions of some really highly carcinogenic air toxics that have really been the focal point of our work at EDF. Um, and at the same time, petrochemical pr production is projected to grow considerably um, at, at an annual rate of, of about 4% um, in the coming years. And um, so it's typically kind of considered to be a lifeline for the fossil fuel industry as we transition away from fossil fuels in the transportation and energy sectors. Um, so just to provide a, a, an example of the implications of this growth, um, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab recently released a report um, estimating that at this 4% um, annual growth rate, emissions from global primary plastic production would increase more than three times um, and would account for between 25 to 31% of the remaining global uh, future global carbon budget uh, needed to limit warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. Um, and this is in large part because um, petrochemicals are typically considered to be hard to decarbonize. Um, and so, you know, we have plenty of evidence that greenhouse gases are accumulating in the atmosphere and um, altering Earth's climate and intensifying um, sort of these extreme weather events like heat waves, hurricanes, and, and even rainstorms. Um, but perhaps what we don't discuss uh, quite as much is how extreme weather can feed back and, and cause additional climate and air pollution. Um, and so one mechanism by which this happens is through um, what, what we call startup shutdown and malfunction emissions or SSM emissions. Um, and we know that weather uh, can actually cause these SSM emissions because facilities uh, will shut down to prepare for a storm. They'll start up following a storm. Maybe they lose power um, during a storm or um, you know, maybe they're even flaring excess gas that they can't send to a downstream facility um, that's experiencing an extreme weather event. Um, so this results in the release of uh, numerous chemicals, including both greenhouse gases and health harming uh, pollution. So at EF, we're, um, we're really interested in identifying potential solutions that could help mitigate these types of weather-related emissions. But um, before we can identify solutions, we really need to characterize these weather-driven SSM um, emission events a little bit better. So what types of facilities most, ex uh, most commonly experience upset emissions, uh, which chemicals are being emitted, when, why, um, and where are these events happening? And so I only have 
time to really just scratch the surface on this work today. Um, so I'll just share one of our findings, which is um, that relative to events that are unrelated to weather, these weather-driven upset emission events are, um, are more likely to occur at multiple nearby facilities since they all experience the ramifications of weather at the same time and at the same place. Um, and so this, this really leads to a, a sort of cumulative health burden that communities experience as they're also managing the ramifications the, of the weather event itself. Um, and so I just want to point out uh, Harris County um, in the southeast uh, area there, um, it's in the dark green, um, it, which indicates that during, uh, during weather events, there are actually seven times as many facilities experiencing SSM emission events compared with, um, with periods without adverse weather. And so there are many limitations to, um, to this analysis. Um, first, we, we only have this um, type of data for Texas. No other states, um, to my knowledge, re require um, reporting this, this uh, level of data. Um, and we know that self-reported industry estimates are not always reliable. Um, so therefore, we're, we are interested in using satellite data to, um, to detect and if possible to quantify these, these SSM emissions. Um, and so I kind of want to just pose this question to you all, uh, which is which satellite data products might we use to detect these types of emissions? Um, because, you know, it's one thing to say, well, I'm interested in regional scale NO2 um, and you just find the right NO2 satellite product. Um, but with these SSM emission events, um, we have multiple chemicals being released, including greenhouse gases, criteria pollutants, and VOCs. They're being emitted over relatively small spatial and temporal scale scales. And so how can we get creative about leveraging one or more products from one or more satellites um, to identify these upset emissions? And I think that the, um, the use of Veer's night fire for identifying oil and gas flaring activity is a really great example of this type of creativity. Um, but you know, of course, uh, those findings are limited to, to flaring activity at, at night. Um, so another project I just want to touch on is a report we collaborated on with um, the Environmental Law Clinic at the UT Austin School of Law. Um, and the goal of this report was really to help lawyers understand how specific data sets could be useful in different types of legal actions. Um, but also on the flip side, to help data analysts and data scientists like me understand how we can make our analyses most useful um, to the lawyers that we work with. Um, and so this report details many different types of legal applications, um, including permit challenges, rulemakings, um, citizen suits, and more. Um, so I just want to provide um, an example of just one, one of the many applications. Um, and so just as a bit of background, in the U.S., you can't just sue anyone because you think that they're doing something wrong. Um, you need to demonstrate that you have what is called legal standing. And so this means you have to demonstrate that uh, first you've been injured. Uh, second, that the injury was caused uh, by the person or entity that you are suing. And third, that your, in your injury would be redressed by a favorable decision. Um, and so this report lists out several data sets that you could use to help demonstrate each of these points, including air monitoring data, model output, um, and chemical toxicity information. And so uh, I know you all are wondering, does this report uh, mention any NASA data? Um, and the answer is, is yes, um, but we actually don't have very many of, uh, examples um, in, in there about how um, it has been or could be used. And so my second set of questions for you all is, um, are there existing examples of where satellite data has been used in air quality related legal proceedings? Um, and, you know, if not, <laughs> or even if so, what kinds of, of scientific demonstrations would be needed for, um, for satellite data to, to hold up in court? Um, okay, so I just wanna finish with um, my personal journey. <laughs> so uh, this graph shows my excitement about satellite data over time. Um, you can see uh, the straight line at the, be at the beginning on, on the x-axis there is it's before I knew about satellite data that you could use it for air pollution. Um, when I first learned about using satellite data, my excitement really shot up. I was like, we can measure air pollution everywhere. This is awesome. Uh, so I, I, I rode that high for a little bit and um, started to realize, you know, some of the limitations that, that come in wor with working with this type of data. You know, you can't easily get surface concentrations, um, limited spatial resolution, you have to think about chemistry. Um, and so my excitement really started to tank. Um, <laughs> but I, I did wanna say that being involved with this HACAST community and um, learning more about what appropriate applications of satellite data look like um, has really helped me regain hope that satellite data can be useful for our work um, at EDF and also beyond. 
Um, and, you know, this graph shows my excitement kind of plateauing, but who, who really knows what the future holds. And um, I, I just want to thank you all for being here at this meeting and, and helping me along my personal satellite data journey. <laughs> oh. Thank you very much, Libby. Thanks for uh, doing some of my work and posing questions to the audience. <laughs> I appreciate it, but um, hopefully we'll have time and certainly uh, pre and post to get to them. Next up is Ted Russell from uh, Georgia Tech. Thanks, Chris. And what I'm gonna be talking about today is sort of an advanced air quality modeling approach. It's called adjoint modeling. And we've used it with satellite data as well as some other projects. And just in terms of the control, CO2 control benefits, that's I think something that's quite exciting. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. And I just wanna step right into it. Um, and in particular, just looking at what adjoint modeling is, I recognize that many of you have probably never even heard of this, and we're not going to have a chance to go into the details. It's rather mathematically and computationally complex, but what it really does is it truly extends the capabilities of um, air quality models to add sort of a, an, a receptor-based uh, approach. And what that means is we're sort of going backwards in time. We're seeing where the air pollution has come from. And hopefully I'll give you a real feel for what this does and it has multiple applications. So if you think about what sensitivity modeling is, sensitivity analysis is, which you know is in some ways mainly what we use air quality models for, it's really looking as if we start out with some emissions you know, from a source, from a location, we, we track it forward in time to see how it impacts multiple receptors. What adjoint modeling does is ask the reverse question is given what the air quality state is, maybe the concentration of ozone at some location or at lots of locations, how, where did that come from? How did it get there? And what might be done to perturb the ozone? what is done to get it there. And so you've got these two different approaches. The most common approach that we use is sort of seeing how things propagate forward in time. This adjoint modeling does it in the reverse way and it does it in a, comp in a chemically precise way. It sort of takes, takes account of all the processes in chemistry. So if you th think about it, the typical way is forward sensitivity analysis. And what we're gonna do is look at backward sensitivity analysis. So with that, just a couple of the applications I'm gonna talk about when we've used adjoint modeling. Um, and I, I'm not gonna go into the math and all sorts of the other things about it. I hope you get the sort of the um, feel for what the, the value is and how it works just by seeing what, we've, what it's done and how it's been used. So one of the ones I'm gonna talk about is looking at health impacts using adjoint modeling. And the other one is we've done uh, emissions inventory assessment using adjoint modeling, which is sort of what's been the more common approach. Um, and this is a way of getting top-down emissions um, estimates from uh, directly using chemical transport models. So with that, and you see that this is, it's been used by multiple groups. Uh, what we've most recently done is applied it to ammonia emissions. And in particular, what we did is we modeled using CMAC, um, using the base emissions inventory for multiple months, um, essentially worked forward and said, okay, this is our base inventory up there, um, run CMAC, that's what you get, and compared it to YASI um, satellite derived values. And you see that the comparison isn't necessarily that great. So what you can do is then using this, um, adjoint and basically what it does is it says okay how can we best match our CMAC results to what's being observed and it tells us where and by how much to um, increase or decrease the ammonia emissions so that's done uh, using this adjoint you actually only have to run this adjoint a couple of times and by doing that what you get is an optimized emissions inventory, which gives you um, optimized CMAC VCDs that are much closer to the YASI results. And then, so what you can do is you can compare the a priori and optimized emissions of ammonia. And see, you see that they're, they're different and how that variation, uh, how they differ varies by season. 
One of the really exciting things we've done is applied this to looking at health benefits from emissions adjustments. And here's where you really start to get the impression of what it can do is what we've done is instead of essentially asking the question, how do, why is the ozone 70 parts per billion outside today or whatever it might be, what we've done is said, we're gonna, instead of looking at just ozone at one place, we're gonna look in this case, it's primarily particulate matter, exposure, and integrate a health function. So the, the question we're now ask, answering is how do the health benefits, and we monetize these health benefits using the uh, value of statistical life over the whole US, how, do the, how is it impacted by emissions at each location? And what, so this shows you what the power is, is it says how much the emissions at any one location impact health, the value of health, across the United States. And so what you see here is the result of this. And we can just start with the PM 2.5, that's where much of the health benefits are, is what is the impact of PM 2.5 primary emissions? So this isn't the impact of PM 2.5 in the atmosphere, this is the impact of the emissions at every location across the US and Canada in terms of its impact on health in the US. And so what you see is that in some areas, those are emissions are maybe worth anywhere between, oh, let's say 10 and $60 per ton of primary uh, 2.5, um, 10 and $60,000 of uh, dollars per ton. Whereas in some of the more populated regions, it's worth more on the order of, let's say $800,000 per ton, a huge amount. And then you can look at, so that's primary PM, PM 2.5, at every location in the, um, sort of the impacting US health. Then you look at um, ammonia, you also see huge uh, values in, in ammonia emissions, NOx emissions, the values are lower and SO2 emissions, the values are, are low as well. Not nearly so much as they are for ammonia emissions. But you also see that there's tremendous spatial variability in the value of these, these emissions in terms of how they impact health. So that's something you can get out of this is that you really get the value of those emissions where they're occurring, as opposed to looking at sort of an average value over the US. Um, one of the neat things is then you can look at this source by source and look at how um, that's linked to CO2 emissions at the same time, sort of asking the questions, if you're controlling CO2 by a ton, by essentially changing this, um, this source, um, you're gonna get these air quality benefits. So how much are these air quality benefits worth for that ton of CO2 emissions that you're removing? So what this gives, this scale, is the value of the air quality benefits in terms of um, uh, reduced um, premature deaths per ton of CO2 that's reduced. Directly asking, answering the question, what are the air quality benefits per ton? And so what you see is again, you get significant spatial variability in terms of the value of reducing a ton of CO2 emissions. And you can also do this by different sources. And so what you see in terms of looking at the value of reducing a ton of CO2 by let's say electrifying uh, diesel buses, assuming that uh, you're, you're developing it from a non-polluting source, the electricity from a non-polluting source. You see this, this variability and what you can get is values of um, hundreds, if not up to $1,000 per ton of CO2 removed but when you apply this to um, a school bus. And then just, you see that you get even uh, larger benefits if you're doing it for off-road construction, basically that's a dirtier source. Um, one of the neat things, we can also do this on a car. Um, okay, and I'll just leave that up there and to say, if you look from New York, if you reduce, remove a 1998 car, you get about $2,000 worth of air quality benefits. Um, and you see that it, if you redo, remove a newer car, you don't get the same, same benefits. Okay, so that's a summary. It's sort of a neat technique. We're using it for satellite data as well as without, but it really gives you an idea of 
using these advanced techniques, you can get this additional information from it. Thanks, Ted. Really uh, fascinating talk, uh, both on understanding mitigation and then also, uh, sorry, before I make my trend, let me ask the speakers to, to come up why prattle uh, on, anyway, sorry. And as well as improving the accuracy of the numerical models. Anyway, the, uh, I guess I'll, I will normally I jump straight to, I'll take chair's prerogative just to start off yes. with Libby's question about uh, legal proceedings yes. using satellite information. If anyone, maybe I'll start there for the room and then I'll transition to your questions. So I'd say, at least from my perspective, the way that satellite data has been used is mostly for weight of evidence for EPA, um, particularly exceptional event kind of analyses. And in fact, you, at this point, you can't really use the satellite data, at least from an EPA regulatory perspective you have to kind of relate it to the ground monitors. So, but it's interesting with the, with the adjoint technique, I think one of the things you can do, you're kind of looking at over the continental US, here's the impact of reduced emissions, but for a particular point and time, you could do, you can do these influence functions that project back and say, here's where for this point in this time, here's what emissions, here's what processes influenced it. And I'm wondering if that might be a way uh, to think more carefully about how a particular individual or region was impacted by poor air quality. And that's without a doubt. And we're oh. starting to... Without a doubt. And we're looking at essentially addressing environmental justice issues that way is that it really is a, it's a powerful technique. I should not under, you know, it's computationally somewhat intensive, but it's getting much, you know, everything that's computationally intensive is getting more and more doable all the time. So it, it is being added to our bag of, tr bag of uh, um, tricks, if you will. And so it address, directly addresses your question. Thanks for we'll transition to questions. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, I had a question um, kind of mostly targeted for Shanna, Eric, and Libby. Um, all of you sort of um, touched on different ways that um, satellites or data can be used to look at plumes, or um, Shanna, you had uh, mentioned that there was um, a data set for tracking large emission events. And so I was wondering, um, if that was something that Libby, the EDF would be able to use in um, uh, legal proceedings. And if that there's like a community discussion there of connecting those dots. Um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to point out, yeah, we did mention that the NASA EMIT um, sensor that's based on the International Space Station can show you the methane plumes, and we're starting to quantify um, how much is emitted from the different leaks that we see. Um, but we, we have to look at very large um, escapes, super emitter events mostly. So I'll start there. Yeah, I, I just want to say it, thanks for connecting those dots. I think that's why we're all here. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, we have many use cases and for and everything that we have is open science, fully documented, peer reviewed. So people need to use it for their various applications, the data and all the underlying information is there completely open and free. First of all, thank you for keeping us all on time. That's probably the toughest job in, in the room. I just want to reiterate something. I said in my remarks, which is that we see our capability in this context as being very complementary. So um, one of the things that we've done for a number of years is that we've used our satellites to, um, or others have used our satellites to, to tip and queue. So we've been working with the Etropomi science team at Estron since 2019. 
I pointed out that image of the eight plumes in Central Asia. That was a case where Tropomi, the, so the wide uh, area um, mapper and the high detection threshold saw something there and then we were sort of able to zoom in and look at that. And we're actually very much looking forward to doing the same thing with, uh, with methane sat. And uh, one of the evaluation projects for our CSDA um, assessment was in fact coordinated observations with, uh, with the EMIT instruments. So all of these very complementary systems working together to achieve these types of goals. Hi, Luke Valin from EPA. Uh, I had a question for Shanna. Um, does NASA have any plans to deploy a satellite of its own that can quantify national scale, you know, help inform mission estimates of methane or CO2 at a national scale? We have, we, we have open solicitations all the time. Um, the capabilities we have right now are the ones that we're continuing. We're extending the EMIT mission. Um, so it'll be, it'll be up there for the life of the ISS. So that's approximately 2030. Um, but we do have additional capabilities through solicitations that are potentially coming on board. They just have not been announced or selected. Um, yes, good morning. Thank you for your presentations, very informative. Uh, this is for Shannon and Eric, um, particularly, or anybody can answer. Uh, so I'm really curious, are these plume detections, are they, once you get on, are you able, are, is, for example, a regulator like me, would we be able to set notifications? Because we can't be in front of a, a computer 24-7, but is there a, a way to send, let's say, an email notification that something's hitting a threshold and then we take a look and is there anything like that in, in the concepts? No, thank you for pointing that out. That is a request that we've heard before. So that's going in the banks of what we've heard from our users that they would like to see. Um, implementing it right now, there is a UN organization that is taking all of the various satellite data sets, Tropony, um, ours, you know, they're looking at GHG sats, they're highly looking forward to the carbon mapper instrument coming out. They are putting together a methane alerting system. Um, that will do that. It's through the International Methane Emissions Observatory and this methane alerting system called MARS. So that's their primary function is to actually let people know, but mostly they let the, the oil and gas companies know so they can go in and fix it first. And then a few months later, they release it if it hasn't been fixed um, and for the larger community. So they're trying their best to get to these sources and stop the leaks as fast as possible. But thank you for pointing out this extra need we've, we've, we've heard and it's being documented. Thank you. I, I just wanted to mention the EPA has a super emitter program that's been spun up in the, in the federal register. So you can check out that program on the website, still spinning up. Yeah, we contribute our data into the International Methane Emissions Observatory as well, although it's not currently being used for the methane alerting reporting system, just to be clear of that. But that sort of alerting mechanism that you mentioned, we do do that routinely for our commercial customers, where there's an operator that has an interest in n number of sites, and then we provide them alerts when there is an emission event that would warrant uh, like a leak detection or repair action. So thank you for the question. Um, hi, uh, Sarah from the At Atmospheric Science da uh, Data Center at NASA. Um, my question is for Eric, uh, more of like a logistic question. How many satellites are in your fleet and are all of those satellites gonna be available in Earth Data Search? That's a great question. Uh, so we have 12 commercial satellites now, of which 11 are methane sensors and one CO2 sensor. The assessment at this point was only for our methane sensors. And it was, the, the, it was data from the first eight satellites that were part of, of the assessment. But when that data becomes available widely, we do not differentiate between taskings of, of our satellites because there, there's a high degree of inter-satellite precision between, uh, between the instruments. So ultimately, 
when that data becomes available widely through CSDA or it's available now through ESA TPM or UK satellite applications catapult, it just comes from the constellation writ large. Um, oh. um, thank you for a really informative um, panel. Uh, I have a question for Ted. So this receptor forward receptor oriented um, approach sounds really fascinating. I'm just curious about the ways of validating your model. Like how do you know your model is performing correctly and how do you like evaluate its performance? Because I'm more familiar with this kind of forward approach, but in terms of the backward, how do you like evaluate it? Thank you. Functionally, it's you do it the same way is you evaluate the base model because it's based upon the chemical transport model. So you look at how well that the, the base model has captured how the pollution has evolved forward in time. And all we're doing is following exactly the same set of equations going backwards. So it's really based upon the, the verification of the base model as well including if you look at the sensitivities is looking at how well the model has picked up emission changes, um, essentially how the model has responded to emission changes over time. So that's how you do, how we've done it. So I have a question that I'd love to have everybody's perspective on. This has been an amazing panel. And one of the themes I think that's come up is the overlap between health and climate relevant pollutants. And I think from Libby's comment about the flaring to the fact that communities were complaining about the smell of methane leaks and the stakeholder engagement and Susan's research on the correlation and Ted's on the um, controls. And I'd love to have sort of a round robin on how you see the NASA investment in Haycast and future generations of Haycast and NASA investments in greenhouse gas activities and the stakeholder engagement aspects of both of those relating, because I think one challenge we have in working with new communities is that there are so many data products and so many NASA initiatives that it can get a little bit confusing and balkanized. And if we're really trying to put environmental justice communities or state agencies or health organizations as the recipient, how can we serve them without spinning up all these different but related initiatives? And I'll just mention that that'll probably be our last question, but okay. please go ahead, play else. Tracy, no small task for how, <laughs> how to do that. Um, how would I do it? I mean, just, I look at, um, you know, with the, the newer ones, it's gonna, the like tempo and such, um, and coming from sort of a modeling uh, framework is that what it's doing is at least for us when we're going to start address using that data for um, health impacts um, is very much the approach where we've linked the CO2 emissions with the, the NOx emissions, et cetera. And it's really going to ground truth what we're doing in terms of make, making sure that we're getting the right emissions, the right sensitivities you know, in, in our model. You know, I'm not sure that that addresses the complexity issue is you know but it, it does put the information out there that these <clears throat> these co co emissions um or reductions of co emissions that we can we can better observe from space are giving you real health benefits and i think that at least that's that is my sort of approach and i realize it's very model based sorry no, about no, that no, that's no, where no, i that's come great. from <laughs> We haven't heard from Susan or Libby. I was. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, I think in this space, we often have this problem of like, I think I've talked on a panel about this before of like this stalemate where we, we work with, um, you know, communities or, or even lawyers like, um, and we're like, well, well, what do you want to know? Like we, like we, um, what, what analysis do you need? Like what we'll tell you. And, and then they'll come back to us and say, well, what can you tell us? <laughs> and so it's like this stalemate. Um, and I, I, um, 
I, I think the solution is kind of like just starting somewhere and just starting that conversation, um, uh, you know, coming to it uh, from a place of humility of like, I don't need to know everything about using satellite data or the science behind it before I talk to somebody who's an expert about it um, because they're like really there to, um, to help like connect us stakeholders with, with the data. So um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think it's all about communication and um, uh, humility and yeah, just um, being willing to, to talk with, with one another. Yeah, Tracy, thank you for this great uh, question that integrates across all of us. And, you know, I, I think from a public health perspective, you want to know what are the challenges and then what are the many things that are contributing to it? And um, that's why in, in our research, we've been expanding beyond air quality and integrating greenhouse gas emissions and vegetation indices to try to understand natural spaces. You know, would love to incorporate physical activity, physical inactivity in, in urban areas. These are the problems that cities are challenged with. If we are only considering, you know, the atmospheric composition side of things, that's going to lead us down the path of one solution. But I think if we worked across all these different risk factors, you know, maybe we'd come up with solutions that would lead to a healthier society overall. So um, love the work that HACAS is doing to bring it in multiple uh, risk factors. And, you know, I think as I reflect on how the community has grown from ACAS to, you know, various iterations of HACAS, that really has expanded. And it's, it's um, really, I think, going to lead us to communities that understand multiple risk factors and know who to go to, to get the details about the different things that we don't know about, um, and to be able to come up with solutions that solve multiple problems simultaneously. Okay, I did allude to it in my comments, but this has been a fantastic meeting because this is a great use of NASA's money. You, you, you've assembled, they've assembled a wonderful cast of stakeholders and scientists that know to work together. And that's, that's what NASA wants to see, Earth action. Scientists talking to people who can make decisions. And I think that the U.S. Greenhouse Gas Center doesn't need to start that because people like you exist. This group exists. So we've been trying to plug ourselves into these boundary organizations, these, these conglomeration of wonderful people that are already talking and building the relationships with those groups and, and building on the existing relationships. It doesn't make sense to do stakeholder fatigue anymore and just keep asking the same questions when you've already started. So that's where we've, we've come from. And thanks to John for telling me to come to this meeting because this has been wonderful. Thanks everyone. Let's, uh, let's give our panelists a round of applause.